Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we'll wait just a minute or two for everybody to kind of filter in, um, but I can, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, I'm Margaret Pozzala Granland. I'm the director of the TCNJ Art Gallery and also the Sarnoff Collection at TCNJ. Um, and I'm very excited tonight to um, bring you the first artist talk. Um, related to the exhibition thread, which just opened today in the TCNJ Art Gallery. Um, the actual full title of the exhibition is Thread, Jim Denemy, Maria Dunlow, and Jessica Wimbley. Um, those are the three artists in the exhibition. And tonight we will be hearing from Maria. Um, let's see, I'll do just a quick introduction. I first learned about Maria's work um, from the Philly Photo Arts Center, which is now, I believe, called the Tilt Institute, um, where she had done an outdoor project um, using images from archives, which I thought sounded really exciting and really interesting. Um, and when I was working on the exhibition, um, Anita Allen, a colleague here at the College of New Jersey, recommended I check out her work for this exhibition. Um, so I'm very grateful to Anita for that suggestion um, and very glad that um, she agreed to take part in the exhibition. Um, Maria Demo was born in the Philippines and immigrated to the United States mainland, where she currently lives and works in the traditional territory of the Lene Lenape Philadelphia area. She received a BA in studio art and art history from Rutgers College and an MFA in studio art at Hunter College, SUNY. Maria's work has been exhibited, screened, and performed in the US and internationally. Most recently, she completed a commissioned installation for Auckland Museum and Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in New Zealand, and she was awarded the Center for Emerging, Emerging Visual Artists Fellowship and the Leeway Transformation Award. Um, so we're very pleased to have her work in the TCNJ Gallery and very pleased to have her with us tonight. Um, we'll be taking questions. Um, please feel free to put your questions either in the chat or the q and I'll be looking at both of them. Um, we'll leave time for questions at the end, but if you have something that you want to bring up right away, um, just put it in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it. Um, and that's about it. So welcome, Maria. Um, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, okay. Um, thanks, Margaret, and thanks students at uh, the College of New Jersey, and which I understand is formerly Trenton State, formerly Trenton State College. Actually, I have a few friends who went there and don't know who, where TCNJ is. Um, so that's actually a fun thing to share. And thanks, Anita, for thinking of me and inviting me in this uh, community. I'm very excited to be sharing my work. And also, um, uh, it looks like a fairly small group of people here anyway, so um, we'll keep it casual. So if you have any questions, I don't mind uh, you just uh, interrupting when I'm, when I'm talking and just saying, excuse me, I, uh, you know, what was that again? Or, or if you want me to uh, elaborate in certain things if I'm going too fast. Um, so I am going to share my screen now. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, I'm just gonna uh, give you a uh, background of where the work uh, is coming from. Um, you know, I have to start somewhere uh, with, with the, the background of the work and this is where I will start this particular work. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the exhibit uh, yet, but it opened today. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, this is, uh, it might not make sense because you're not interacting with it, but just bear with me and I'll try to elaborate it. Um, so the context of the work that you see, and I'm going to actually do this, hold on a second. All right, you could still see my screen, right? Because it's distracting for me to see. Yep, um, that's still, I can still see okay. it. Okay, so the background of the uh, of the show that you see that that's in the gallery right now comes from a work that I started called History in RGB, and this is one way that you've 
that it's been installed. And uh, when it started out, I had this immersive installation where the viewer can uh, enter the space, become surrounded by domesticated tropical vegetation, uh, mosquito nets and fish nets with embroidery um, on them, as well as the prints. And then the, the viewer, this is not moving forward, hold on a second. I guess I have to use this. Okay, the viewers um, are um, have uh, filters that they can uh, pick up, and the filters are usually red, green, and blue. And uh, the viewers can look through the 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 prints um, and see uh, some hidden narratives within the print. So when they look through the prints, um, a different story is revealed with each choice of the filter. We're still just seeing your title slide. Wow, okay. Let's see, but that didn't work. I'm going to stop share. And if I move back, can you see this changing Ooh. or no? Yep, now we can see, see it changing. Change. Okay, yep. great. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you caught you told me that. <laughs> so this is the installation I was telling you previously about the domesticated plants and nets. This is some of the examples of filters that um, that were previously shown. I, I used to cut out these um, these museum boards where the filters are are tucked in. So the images, when you look through the filters and even with that, so this is like a, you know, when, when the, someone took a photo of the filter in front of it, half showing the filter through filter and half showing it without the filter with just natural light. The, the prints are collage, collaged images of both found and taken photographs and prints and mostly from and about the Philippines, which, which is where I'm from. Um, nature, uh, mythical creatures from, from folklores, images of resistance, and indigenous stories. So by offering different lenses through which each image can be viewed, I want to encourage the viewer to be an active participant who can freely compare multiple views in an exercise that constantly shifts the hierarchies set forth by different value systems. This is an installation outside the windows of uh, PPAC, now Tilt, uh, at the Crane Arts Building in Philly. Uh, this was uh, up during the spring of this year and it came down in the summer. And uh, this image um, is an image of Lapu-Lapu, the same one that I just showed you before. And this is a composite version of that same image. So the image has been cut up on these windows to split, but this is the image as a whole. On top, you'll see the uh, image in natural light. And in the bottom is a com composite of, if you were to look at that print in green and then under natural light, and then on the right is under the red filter. So seeing through a green filter, uh, it reveals a, a recent photograph of a, of a jungle that you would find in the, um, the archipelago in different parts of the Philippines. This is a typical jungle scene. And then this is the same image in natural light. And then this same image through a red filter. And it takes longer to see the red, the red um, seeing through the red filter for the narratives to come in. Um, as opposed to like the green is actually more immediate. Um, so under the red filter, you see uh, the resistance of um, the natives fighting the Spaniards. Uh, Lapu-Lapu is the main figure with like the big rock holding up a rock and is about to throw it on someone. He's uh, regarded as the first Filipino hero because he was the first native to uh, to openly resist the imperial Spanish colonization. And he was the one who killed the explorer Magellan. And Magellan uh, was hailed as one of one, the one who discovered the Philippines. He's kind of like, or not kind of, he is the equivalent of Christopher Columbus um, in this country. 
So for more than 400 years, the Philippines celebrated Magellan's discovery of the islands, where there is still no holiday that recognizes the native hero Lapu-Lapu. So, you know, that's similar to uh, these lands uh, that we are just recently changing the Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, it's still not fully accepted yet, I don't think, but that's what's going on. And this one is Native Children, Thomasites, Mayon Volcano, and Capre. So this is the composite of the same print. You see it twice. On the top is under natural light. And then the bottom is a zoomed in version of the one on top. And when you zoom in, uh, you see um, on the green, you see the Thomasite spaces and they're clear while the children's are obscured. And then the Thomasites, um, and for FYI, the Thomasites are American teachers who traveled to the newly occupied territory of the Philippines. And then uh, seen through the red filter, the children faces, children's faces are clear. They become clearer while uh, the teachers and their families are obscured. Uh, the, the main original image is based on a photograph from the early 1900s of native children in traditional clothes. And uh, I also added in the back an erupting Mayon volcano from, uh, it was actually from 2018. So I wanted to tie it back to the present, which is when I made this. Um, so something that is, um, um, I wanted to suggest that although these are uh, historical images, we're not removed from it. Um, we are still living this, um, although it looks different, right? So it, the fashion may look different and uh, the, in, the images of indigeneity might be slightly different, but this kind of um, uh, teaching or uh, the savior mentality is very present. But, um, and I do this through um, the continuous image of nature as being present. Um, I also have, well, it's actually not in this image, but on the right side is a, a tree god. I added a tree god in there, which is a big part of the Filipino culture to have mythological uh, creatures um, be part of our everyday. So um, with the change of filter, um, uh, I, I want to evoke also a whole new sense of physical and, uh, you know, not just relating it back to um, the present or the past, um, but a new sense of physical and maybe a, a cognitive or even uh, emotional presence for some. Um, so with different color change, the presence and uh, expressive signaling can be completely erased, right? So again, that's... Uh, the green and red, and with uh, without the filter, you can see that the stories can be hidden in plain sight. And so, if you hadn't been to the space, um, here is a demo. Um, this is not any of the images that you'll see in the gallery, but this is a demo of um, the prints that I was, the series of prints I was showing you. Um, so this one is the uh, wild boar attacked by a boa constrictor. And does anyone have any questions? I can't see the chat, but I see there's maybe someone may have posted, but someone could just read that. I'm okay with that if it's something that you'd like to share. So the video um, shows how a viewer might experience a selection of prints in person. So the series uh, synthesizes formal and thematic con concerns in color theory, installation, digital imaging, photography, seeing and understanding as a mediated experience, colonialism in personal and gener general terms, and questions of authenticity and meaning in image making. So I try to cover all of those. I think about all those things all the time anyway. So I'm trying to um, include them all um, when making decisions uh, with these prints. So 
I, I'm offering the viewer to examine the mechanics of representation where light, color, and image can become experiential devices used to convey power and point of view, and to question who has and has had the privilege and power to tell both contemporary and historical narratives through images presented as truth. The filters become tools for revelation and clarity as they isolate elements to create a monochromatic narrative. They also produce a model background by obfuscating the other narratives that exist in the same on the same surface. And uh, yeah, so this just plays. So it's the same image. Okay, and I think it just looped. Okay, so this one is an alay, isang alay at manananggal. And this is again um, the same print. Uh, on the top, you have uh, the the print uh, under natural light without uh, filters, and then you have um, the red filter and the green filter. So. Um, as you notice, I've just been sharing only the red and green filter. I haven't been sharing any of the blue filter because the blue is actually something else that is by itself, um, it's, it's one of those that are just, it's just really difficult to document. Like these are difficult to document as it is. Um, but uh, the blue filter is a whole other thing that um, a lot of people uh, don't see anything in it, like don't see anything clearly, but for some people they really like it because it just suggests um, uh, nighttime or or looking underwater. Um, so he has a whole other experiential thing that that I, I don't even share in this presentation. Um, so you're just gonna have to see yourself. So um, so the title of, of this one, it's uh, Alay Isang Alay Manananggal. It includes the words Manananggal and Alay. And uh, what it is, is that um, Manananggal is a nocturnal vampire-like creature in the Filipino folklore. Um, and if you grew up in the Philippines, and especially if you're from a certain uh, uh, class of people who are <laughs> often like playing on the streets and don't really live in any gated uh, community, um, you're, uh, you're, you know about these stories because it's very present. It's not one of those that uh, you just hear it and you think it's like, oh, it's a story, like, you know, Santa Claus is a story. Uh, this uh, story is actually quite real to a lot of us. Um, it's just uh, some of the things that you believe in and you accept as a part of reality, you know, you may never see one. Hopefully you will never see one, but it is around us. So like folklore is a big, um, or um, mythological creatures are very present um, in the Philippines. So she is, um, she's this figure that, uh, uh, she's depicted here with bat wings and uh, she is a vampire-like creature. She roams at night. Um, she, she detaches her upper body from her bottom body, and she plants her bottom body near the banana trees, which is why I have banana trees there. And she, she um, flies around at night to raid for human flesh. And then by day, she's a, uh, she's a regular person, a good citizen who keeps a decent human house, and she's just a good citizen. And in Tagalog, uh, our language, in when my language, uh, alay means offering, helper, or assistant. And it is, uh, sounds exactly like alay in English. Um, and then um, uh, in this particular image, I chose this, her to be the Manananggal because in the original photo has, uh, has her with an American flag. Um, so in the Philippines, the Americans, uh, uh, give out American or U.S. US uh, flags to welcome the U.S. soldiers as they come through their town. So you're supposed to wave it. So she, here she's a good uh, ally, but then at night she's her own self. <laughs> Sorry, okay, I lost track. Okay, so the, in the red version, um, you see more of her as a bat, 
more of her, or more of her as a manananggal, more of her with the bat wings as a protagonist, and she's wearing a traditional weaving. Um, and then in green, she is a young woman returning the gaze of the photographer, presumably an American soldier. And she waves the US flag while flanked by these uh, banana trees. So um, to me, the image speaks to how uh, a non-Filipino viewer might focus on her pretty face, but a Filipino ex-person might question her sp spiritual identity. Um, the subject seems happy to greet uh, the Americans while simultaneously filled with, possibly with cultural dread at being saved by occupying troops. And then this one, you saw this in the video documentation. This is wild boar attack by a boa constrictor. Um, so this is part of my, um, like a good example of how my interest in how images and by extension history, desire and experience are mediated. Um, the audience can choose to use the, the offered lenses, giving them the agency to see multiple narratives and to mediate their own experience. So this act of looking through a lens also offers a sense of discovery and examination and indulges our deeply rooted impulse to glimpse at the other, which may also be the other within us, right? And I'll, if, if you want me to elaborate on that, I'd be happy to. <laughs> it took a lot of therapy to figure that out in myself. So <laughs> with this gesture, I suggest that the legacy of colonialism as seen through images created by American European colonizers position the viewer as a voyeur who discovers a fertile landscape that is ripe for explore, exploitation. So I intend this work to be accessible and interactive to many, uh, young and old, from artists to um, from artists who are versed in uh, art history or color theory to folks who normally don't visit art and cultural spaces, such as um, some members of my family who are nurses and teachers and are religious, um, or maybe even to the younger Catholic girl I once was and, and uh, someone who didn't understand the power of representation and images, and I'm still figuring this out. Um, okay. I may have to skip some of this just for time, but okay. So, so this work is, um, shares my own transformative process. Like I said, um, a lot of like othering within myself. Um, and I, I just want the viewer to have a aha moment um, where an actual shift in visual perspective happens. So I want, I want the viewer to have this immersive bodily experience that is tangible and physical with the feeling of discovering some kind of truth in the notion of taking blinders off deception. So I see this as a, a moment that's a, um, an opportunity to, to break through and, and arrive at a, a different moment. Hopefully. <laughs> so, um, how did I arrive at this work? So, um, give you a little history lesson. Um, so, because colonized history, because uh, so the colonized history of the Philippines is is ingrained in me. So, since I, you know, since uh, generations and generations of Filipinos were born, we've always been in a country that was uh, colonized, right? So colonized history is ingrained in us. So my earliest education and understanding formed a colonized body and mind. So that means like everything I learned, I learned from uh, the lens of um, either the Catholic church uh, uh, from the Spaniards or um, the certain education at schools, which were modeled after uh, US education. So it's always uh, necessary for me to remind myself that my usual and default reactions or actions are based on the conditioning of my ancestors, colonizers. So my own transformation begins with the revelation of uncomfortable and at times spooky and painful narratives that reveal themselves to me through working with the cultural and historical images that I find. 
So even recent images such as this, um, this, this ad that is uh, still used around, uh, around us till this day. And, and you know, even in the US, there is some sort of uh, ad like this. You know, this is like a very um, modeled after an American ad, but this is a type of ad that you would see in the Philippines. Um, it's still very much present today. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this part. So um, if you are interested in the background of the mythology and how I came about incorporating mythology, um, I'd be glad to talk about that, but I think I need to get to the actual show um, that's in the gallery right now. So, um, so it was in, uh, in college, like a lot of you are in college right now, that um, I took classes in art history and photography. Um, like I said, I, I wasn't born into a culture that, that um, really paid much attention to um, high art. Um, so I came into it through pop culture and then I went to college and took art history classes and photography. Um, and it was there that I started to question faith, my faith and ideology and how it can be constructed through the power of images. So images are produced according to the patrons who hold power and wealth. So my example here is the Hagia Sophia. Um, it's in Istanbul, formerly Constantinople. Uh, Hagia Sophia is a Byzantine architecture commissioned by the Roman emperor as a church. It was then converted into a mosque during the Ottoman Empire and then secular Turkish Republic. Uh, established it as a museum, and then only a year ago or so, 20, uh, yeah, 2020, it reopened as a mosque. So I wonder about um, how one comes into a space of worship and how they, they go through ecstatic experience because they are engulfed in the magnificent magical space. And this same magical space serves different faith depending when, depending on who's in power. Um, and this goes for any, uh, any art historical images, right? Depictions of Christ, how the uh, illiterate could easily be seduced in grand representations because, um, you know, their patrons are, are represented as the saints who are so close to God. And so um, the illiterate and the poor can actually easily be manipulated to believing that these, um, the patrons must be, um, you know, more holy, more godly. So, um, so that's like the beginning of when I was like, huh, okay. So if, uh, if you can manipulate that many people and my own understanding in my past is based on these um, structures that were presented to me, hmm, maybe there is something there that I need to ask myself, re-evaluate re re everything I know. So it was the beginning of my fascination with the notion of truth as an unfixed entity. For truth to be part of the dialogue in looking at and understanding images, whether one is wanting to believe that there is some kind of truth or asking whose truth is being represented or who has the power to define the truth. I wondered about my individual understanding as part of a collective history and as an immigrant, one who is viewed through a lens. So in studying art, I realized that faith could be placed not in an authoritative higher power, but in an artist's own ability to question, seek, and narrate. So I decided to make art because I know to rely on my own direct perception to make sense of this world. And uh, I also studied uh, some color theory. Um, I didn't really understand it at, um, at my undergrad, I mean, I, you know, I knew it was important for design purposes whatsoever, but um, I, I studied more of it in undergrad, I mean, in grad school, and I studied with um, color field painters, and even then it was really hard for me to understand, like, to separate it from, um, it just seems so separate from life, but um, what really attracted me to uh, Joseph Albers and the interaction of color, particularly this book, is that um, when he said um, in visual perception, a color is almost never seen as it really is, as it physically is. This fact makes color the most relative medium in art. So um, 
you know, so this illustration here, as you can see here, the two orange squares appear to be completely different colors when in reality they are the same. So mindful of the relativity of color and how light and materials influence how uh, pigments absorb and reflect colors differently, I experimented in how light and filters both redefine and abstract depth, as well as uh, shapes and patterns. So this relativity of color appealed to me because of its analogous relationship to the notion of truth, which also relies on relativity, re relativity and can never be, be seen in only one light. Um, and it makes me think about, um, uh, this is a painting by um, Glenn Ligon, um, and he, where he painted a text, I feel, uh, the text says, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. And it was an adaptation from uh, Zora Neale Hurston's essay, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. So again, there is that uh, notion of uh, relativity um, when compared or in relation to another color. And I also, um, uh, I had started to read chromophobia like, you know, earlier on uh, when I started the uh, history in RGB um, and chromophobia or um, the whole book is really interesting, but that the notion of chromophobia or that the impulse of being chromophobic is a, a fear of uh, corruption or contamination through color. And uh, David Batchelor talks about this relative to um, people, right, racism. So he covers all these things. Um, okay, and then the other factor that I think about when putting together this work is um, the, the color palette. So I use a Pantone color palette to, to construct the original. Um, and I based it on uh, Pantone because Pantone is a, it's a US um, constructive color value system. And I did, uh, I searched like, what are the considered tropical palette according to Pantone? So I compiled them and then I narrowed them down to the 16 and this is the 16 I came up with. So all the, um, the previous images you were looking at, all the colors in those are based on these same 16 uh, colors here. And when you rearrange them, um, the, the values change depending on red, green, and blue, right? So, so what, for example, if the yellow is the brightest in red, in blue, it might be, um, uh, the pink, the, you know, in the middle, that pink, the light pink in the bottom might be the lightest color in blue. So again, it's questioning um, hierarchies and value systems. So um, these are some more images from that series. And I'm just going to go through it because I want to make sure I, there's enough time to talk about the images that are in the show. So in the show, um, you'll see benevolent assimilation scenes that do not represent who we are. You know, it's a mouthful, but <laughs> it's important that I include that and I'll explain why. So this, the, the images you see in the gallery are all from 2021. And I wanna talk about and acknowledge that some of the things that I had been thinking about leading up to that work. So one of the things that I was uh, really, really into was like that, um, I think this was released in, 2019, I believe, or maybe 2020, uh, the New York Times uh, released this, the 1619 project, which has actually had been ongoing. It had been um, happening before that. There was the 1619 project and um, the New York Times actually uh, supported it and published a series of it. And there's actually an awesome uh, podcast that, that talks about some of the some of the issues on this. And um, if you're not aware, the 1619 project is, um, it's, uh, it's recognizing the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. And it's reframing how this country's history is, is um, told, right? So 
we, we learn history in this country a certain way um, while it's written by a specific powerful people. And so 1619 Project is questioning that narrative and reframing it from um, if you were, uh, if you were uh, to change the, the, who, who the storyteller is, if it was a different storyteller, having other people in mind. So I'm trying to speak of this like generally, but I think you, everyone should be checking this out. And I know this is a controversial issue for a lot of schools. Um, it's, uh, you may have heard critical race theory being questioned. And I think that is a, an important question to, to understand and to look into if um, you're not familiar. So, um, so yeah, so this is one of the ones that, it's, uh, that I had been thinking about anyway, while I was working on the projects that I was showing you before. And I happened to be um, also researching all these Filipino history. And then I realized that I had been telling the history as uh, I've been telling the history of RGB from the perspective of the Philippines, where I'm questioning the nar narrative there and how um, we were educated there, or we are still educated there, when I should also be questioning um, the education here in this country and how um, uh, the, the history of colonization is not really part of the American history, or at least it's not taught, right? So um, when, when we think about American or the US, we only think about the mainland really, right? So this is like a, a, a map from 1910. And I color, I, the green ones, I actually um, wanna highlight how big that the, and how spread out the um, US territories are. So the, um, the mainland as we know it, which is the logo map, which is like, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse. So this is the logo map, right? So this is how, when they say, when people think about the United States, this is what they think about. But what is not considered is that there's actually a logo map, uh, what do you call it, a pointless map. So Alaska is actually quite big. So it's actually uh, uh, owned by the US as well as, oops, as well as all these other tiny islands in the Pacific. There's all these green dots in there that are um, occupied by the US. And then, you know, there's um, Panama and then Puerto Rico um, and then uh, Virgin Islands. There's all these Caribbean islands as well as Pacific islands all the way down here to uh, Mariana Islands um, and the Philippines this year. So these countries or these lands are actually under the US rule, but you know, they don't get to vote or it's not, most Americans don't even know that this is uh, claimed by the US. So I wanted to um, uh, include these narratives and as to take, just to have a, to be more responsible in, in thinking about US history. And then uh, the title benevolent assimilation, um, I know this is a long quote, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, it's also like, I think really badly written anyway, but essentially what this uh, is saying is when, when the US went to the Philippines, they want to um, assimilate benevolently the, um, the, uh, the Filipinos into being Americans or to educate them or civilize them and make them less barbaric or savages. You know, th th so the benevolent assimilation is a, a campaign kind of like Manifest Destiny is a campaign that the, you know, the colonizers um, use to justify wiping out um, Native Americans. So these are like really, um, th these phrases are, are really manipulative to, to sell. They're like a packaging campaign to, to make Americans feel like, oh, this is a great campaign. Um, you know, doesn't it sound good? We're doing this benevolently. So um, yeah, so the prints. So I don't have versions of the with the filters. I just have the prints here. You're just gonna have to see them for yourself so that you know you get the full experience. But I have them here. Um, so um, this is uh, which one is this? This is the coconut water cure. Um, this one is in the show, and uh, what it is, uh, you do see uh, a past, uh, a beautiful 
pasture-like tropical scene. And you have the Americans um, shown here as um, you know, the, the type of propaganda they would use uh, back to the US and show, look at how our soldiers are you know, um, relaxing and keeping our, our land safe in the um, Pacific, right? So they're singing at night like Boy Scouts. Um, and then this is an image of uh, Water Cure. And Water Cure does not, is not a spa thing, even though it sounds like it, but Water Cure is also known as waterboarding. And um, uh, that's some of the practice that was, um, that was tried, tried there. Um, and, uh, and it carried on till, uh, you know, I, from what I've read, it's actually been practiced secretly still by our military. So, um, so my interest in um, incorporating a lot of these uh, images is how a lot of uh, what we know about policing in this country here uh, domestically was actually tried and experimented and has origins in not only um, the enslaved people in this land, but also um, in colonized territories. In fact, it was perfected as the way they would um, like to, to see um, uh, militarization, policing, and surveillance. Um, alongside that, um, uh, this all happened around 1898. And uh, uh, that was around the time 1898 to 1910, when, when the Americans uh, came to the Philippines. Um, it was also when uh, camera became, uh, quickly became part of the consumer, um, used by consumers, right? It wasn't just uh, certain people using it, anyone can get a camera. So um, it was actually used at that time to, uh, it, it was a very useful technology to bring to a colonized country so they can uh, document the lay of the land for military purposes to, to know where there's like challenges and obstructions or whatever it is where the challenges might be or where it's a good place to, to base, to, to form a base whatsoever. Um, and also to surveil people, right? To uh, criminal, to capture people, to label people, uh, take their mug shots, and identify them. And um, yeah, so it's like a form of surveillance in criminalizing Filipinos. So this is uh, an image of um, soldiers that were once, uh, that, that were once captured and then became um, civilized as military men by American. So the caption in the bottom here, you'll see this better with the, with the um, filters. This is the red letter day. Um, where it's actually part of a newspaper that I got it from. So the stranger says, how long have you been civilized? And the native says, ever since my home was burned, um, my born to the ground and my wife and children um, shot, right? So that's like, um, that's part of the benevolent assimilation campaign. So now they're civilized. And then this one is uh, these uh, gentlemen are supposedly, um, you know, they are the, the gentlemen, <laughs> the clean clothes that were civilizing the Filipinos. And um, the, the bottom has a, a rows of Filipinos also who were, had been civilized. And the caption that I got, this one is actually from the image that's down here. And it says the original caption was no photograph can give an adequate idea of the native soldiers in their spotless uniforms of white duck waist, waistcoat and trousers with hats of manila straw. Their guileless and innocent appearance is a good cover for their crafty um, natures. So um, that's said on this, um, these images, but you can apply it to the actual American soldiers. So I wanted that to to juxtapose those two ideas. This is actually not in the show. This is an early version that um, I, it's an early version in that I made a better version of this um, that's, that you're gonna see in the show. Um, so one of the things I was um, incorporating also is 
that um, you know that that Kodak ads has uh, uh, shows a lot of uh, technology where kids have cameras and guns as well. So in it's a form of play. Um, while at the same time in the back we have an image of um, uh, one of the uh, events that happened in one island was um, they killed all the kids um, or everyone in the town who were 10 and above. Um, and there is a, 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 I found this in a newspaper where they're actually uh, killing the kids. Like this is an illustration obviously, but um, where they're saying because they were, they are criminals because they were born uh, 10 years, um, at least 10 years since we occupied or since we, so we, we took this land, right? So I wanted to incorporate like the, the different um, uh, interpretations that we see 10 year olds, you know, and we see this in this country as well where um, 10 year olds are innocent, but, and yet um, like a black 10 year old, if they commit something, uh, you know, if they're caught stealing something, whatsoever, they're, they're treated as criminals, as adult criminals. So there's like this, judgment of different ways that we treat 10 year olds. So I wanted to uh, juxtapose those things. And then this image is also in the, I think this is in the show. I'm not really sure Margaret if this is in the show, but this, this is one again, we didn't have room for. Okay, sadly. so this one is not in the show, but, but I wanted to um, show that criminalization, like the, you know, the camera um, uh, documented people like they they did this headshots, and then uh, they put a record of uh, if they are, um, you know, if someone some experts are interpreting them if they are like criminals or they're likely to be criminals, and what language do they speak, which tribe are they from, and you know, are they affiliated? Do they seem like uh, good to Americans? And then um, the other technology that I wanted to bring up is um, uh, the weapons at the time, also early 1900s. Um, they had, they were developing weapons, uh, of course, as always, we're still developing weapons in this country uh, constantly. But at the time, this specific uh, Colt 45 was developed um, around the time when um, uh, the Filipinos, were uh, charging at the Americans during like, you know, when there was um, resistance. Um, and the Americans were writing back to the US saying that we need a stronger stopping power because these Americans are, I mean, these Filipinos just like would have, they wouldn't have a gun, but they have these um, knives and they would charge at you. And no matter how many times the Americans shot at them, they wouldn't stop and they would keep charging and they wouldn't stop and they wouldn't die until they actually arrive at the Americans. And then they just like plunge their knives to the Americans. So it wasn't a strong enough stopping power. So they needed a stopping power. So Colt 45 um, came to save the American soldiers from, um, from themselves, from like the Filipinos trying to save their lands. Um, so I incor incorporated this with, um, this embroidery because um, also um, Filipinos are really good at, uh, or at least at the time, um, there was a craft of embroidering. And um, this is when uh, around 1900s is when the Americans also realized that there's uh, cheap labor that they can cultivate. Like um, they would have these ads in, um, in the uh, magazines for the housewives in the US saying it's really, uh, you can get this really dainty, uh, beautiful lace hand embroidery, um, really cheap. And it was advertised and uh, they found, uh, you know, cheap labor and uh, took the, yeah, took the skills uh, from the Puerto Rico and both Philippines and had all these uh, embroideries sent back here. So yeah, so this is another version of it. I'm not sure which one is there. And then the color palette I got is um, not necessarily from Benjamin Moore, but from various design. Um, the colors were specific to American color palettes from that uh, period. So it's a little bit more muted than the ones I was showing before. And this is the final uh, selection I had. 
And yeah, and I have a bunch of other collages here, but what I want to say is um, um, what, what another thing that what, what motivated me to actually work on these um, series is uh, I started this in the beginning of this year, 2021. And, but it's something that I had been thinking about in the last year anyway, uh, during the pandemic or the global pandemic of, uh, and being forced to shut down um, and whatever, and everything else that's happening in this country, uh, both political and social unrest um, that, that were um, accelerated and uh, damaged by, by the um, Trump and his administration, along with um, his uh, um, influence of, of empowering white supremacy. Um, so when the insurrection occurred in the Capitol Hill in the beginning of the year, uh, Biden said, uh, President Biden said, at that point, he's already a president. Um, he said about that event, that the scenes that occurred in the Capitol Hill do not represent who we are. So that's where the other, the second part of the title is. So when he said that, I was reminded of how confused many of us were back in um, November 2016, when Trump was elected, when um, many Americans woke up thinking that we thought we knew who we are and how far we've come along as a country but apparently what many of us thought we knew or think about ourselves as a country is not who we are. And then I ask about, uh, I was asking about like, well, with these scenes that occurred at the Capitol Hill, do they not represent who we are? Um, because um, we, we uh, Americans still don't know um, a big chunk of our history and where this come from and how this country was founded. Um, so, uh, so this part of the project, I, I looked up recorded history, not specifically the history of the Philippines or how the US colonized it, but rather the history of the US as a colonizer. So this story is not just Filipino story, but it's actually a hidden American history that is part of this country's identity. So I wanted to understand better how this country um, not specifically my history as a Filipino or Filipino American, but the history of the US um, as its own uh, framing of history. So I, I wanted to um, focus on this time period and which happened soon after the, the Wounded Knee Massacre, right, in 1890 when, so the big mainland, the United States as we know it is, um, these are other collages, I mean, as um, it's not far from when, when this, uh, this land has uh, taken away from Native Americans. So, um, and I wanted to make sure we have enough time to, we can answer questions. So I wanted to share this quote um, that I actually just saw this earlier today that George Takei uh, posted on social media. Is it wrong to teach about the Japanese American internment now because I've spent my whole life telling our story and I'll be damned if I let some fool at the school board meeting refuse to let their kids hear about what happened to us. The truth people teach the truth. So I thought um, that's appropriate to share with you as part of like, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I, I truly believe that um, it is important to understand these things. And, and these are images from today that Margaret shared with me and I'm very excited to see this in person. So this is how the show looks like and some of the students, maybe some of you are in that picture, um, how um, they're, they're interacting with the, the images with the filters. And then my last slide here is my parting words from the great Toni Morrison because I, I know most of you are students. So she said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs, when you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not just a grab bag candy game. So um, are there any questions?
for me. Um, there are questions. My dogs were apparently listening because now they're being really loud in the background. They're so now excited. You're done talking, they can like start barking. Um, <laughs> Anita asked about the images of the Colt 45. Um, you should just, you know, with your the last few slides from the show, you showed. Um, and she wondered if those images include scans of the lace that's made in the Philippines. If, if they're, um, sorry, let me just look for them. Hold on. Um, I'm going to escape this slideshow view so I can navigate it. Okay. This one second, number 45. It's good because I actually can't see the numbers on these slides, but okay i'm sorry what is the question again this this the image that you're referring to oh let me see if i could open the chat actually i don't know if i could see it oh i think i was muted she was wondering if the images um with the guns in the center also include scans of the lake <laughs> Uh, scans of the um, the lace. Yes. Yeah. So this is actually not an I know I mentioned that I do embroidery as well, but this is not an embroidery. This is actually a print of an embroidery. Um, and eventually I'm going to incorporate both and with the actual embroidery on it. But uh, these are prints um, of, of embroidery. Um, but what exactly is the question? I feel like I didn't answer it. Um, Scans of the lace. Yeah. Um, yes, that is a scan of a lace. And that's actually from one of the museums. Um, and it is a uh, it is a Filipino lace from 1900s. Um, so the camera yes. and the and the guns. So I feel like those are uh, the guns and they came about around the same time and they're both weaponized. Um, in their own way, right? So the technology, the development of, of um, guns having a more stopping power, um, it, it might just be a coincidence that um, they developed this gun and then at the same time, the Americans were writing back at home asking for a stronger stopping power. Um, that could just be a coincidence, but it definitely made an impact in how they fought the wars. Um, and then uh, the camera to me uh, is uh, weaponized in a way that um, it was easier to carry. Uh, uh, and previous to, to this um, and starting with the, the uh, occupying uh, the North America, um, there were not a lot of uh, photography then. There were some illustrations, but the photography really came about around that time. And then at this point, it was part of the consumer grade that you know anyone can get it. And you can see that the ads, um, the Kodak ads uh, that were shown here in the U.S. Um, were uh, sh were sh were selling them as a as a as a way to to uh, yeah, to enjoy just like the same we do now, but it was showing it a lot to like, you wanna go hunting, you know, you wanna, if you go hunting or if you go as a scout or if you go explore the land, you wanna have the camera with you. So there is that, um, there's that idea of, uh, of territorial and uh, colonizing and, uh, and uh, taking, and that even the idea of photography as uh, taking a picture where things are taken, it, it, it all came around that time. So I wanted to incorporate what was going on technologically, how it was used in the uh, in war, uh, how it was weaponized, and how it was sold in this country as a uh, mythology. The myth, you know, that that was the, the mythology that was being sold here, you know, consumerism, um, buying the lace clothes. Um, where these these islands that we own, our properties, our our people, our brown friends, right? So there's um yeah, I wanted to incorporate all that as part of this narrative 
and, and putting it in context of what was going on in this country and what was being told here and what was happening somewhere else, but not being told here. And what, how do we study it now? Um, and then. Cool. One thing I was um, struck by and curious about was when you're talking about how viewers interact with the artwork and you talked about like light being a device or color being kind of a, a tool that you're giving to your viewers. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that's interesting because it puts them in such an active position of like discovery, right, with these images. Um, and I wonder if you could talk more about that, about the idea that people, you know, are kind of um, encountering these images and you're giving them the tools, you know, kind of handing over the tools to explore them. Mm -hmm. Um, and how you think about that kind of interactivity or experience for the viewers. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that part um, is so important to me that um, the viewer has the agency to control what it is that they're seeing. So one can look at the, the prints and just leave it the way it is, like not really care for it or just see it for what it is. But you have the agency to look through a different lens and see it through a different lens and, and discover that for yourself. Um, and uh, there is a lot, uh, some of the images has more narrative, like more, it's not just like a dual thing. There's actually multiple layers of, of images. Um, and the more time you spend with it, um, the more you look and compare to different lenses, there's, um, I'm hoping that there's like more things that actually, uh, that encourages the viewer to, to uh, uh, the question why uh, these these different narratives are in the same plane. Why are they happening simultaneously? What is the relationship between the, the different narratives? So I think it's up to the viewer how much time they want to spend on it. Um, yeah, so agency is so important uh, for one to understand, you know, instead of just giving everything and say, this is what it happened. This is what I believe. You take it or leave it. I think it's up to the viewer giving it, giving the op the viewer the opportunity to um, um, explore that possibility. Hopefully, they can take that with them as well. That you know that maybe there are more ways than one to look at uh, something. You know. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it also makes me think about like all of the current discussion about teaching of history, right? Which is really not about, you know, looking deeply and seeing multiple points of view. Like there, you know, there's so much pushback on that and the idea that there is one history and one right way to teach it. And the 1619 project is not the way to teach history. Um, so I like that your images are engaging with that idea that history is complex, that there are many stories and that there are many, um, many layers to any, to any image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you're giving agency yeah, to people to kind of make that, make that exploration, which I think is great. Thanks. Well, we Do are just... <laughs> Pardon? Go on. I, um, I was just wondering to... if the students have any questions. Yeah, are Thanks there any other questions? But <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Um, we're a little bit over, but we could certainly take another question if anyone had something. And otherwise, I would encourage you to visit the gallery. Um, it's open Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 12 till 7. Um, and on Sundays from 1 till 3, we will be closed over the um, Thanksgiving long weekend. Um, that's a, a break for the college. Um, and the show is open through December 9th. Um, so the I believe that's the last day of, almost the last day of classes. Um, the gallery is also open by appointment, so if you can't make it during those hours, just email us and we can figure out a way to get it open for you. So we're always happy to have visitors. So um, 
So thank you so much, Maria. This was great to hear about your work. Um, I feel very fortunate to have it in the gallery. Um, and thanks so much for sharing about your process and your sources and your inspirations. That's been, that's been really great to hear all that. Thank you.